Welcome to Growth Sessions. Today I have an awesome guest, Gabby Lewis, co-founder of Magic Spoon. I'm a huge Magic Spoon fan, Gabby. I've been eating the cereal for a couple of years now. I've got my wife hooked. We have it at the Perpetual Office all the time. Couldn't be more excited to have you here. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. So Gabby, you have some big news this month. Magic Spoon has expanded rather significantly into a lot of retail stores. Can you tell us more about this news? Yeah, of course. So we started our business initially direct to consumer. And for those who don't know, we make a high protein, low sugar, low carb breakfast cereal that looks and tastes just like you remember. And so we launched in 2019. The first couple of years were entirely direct to consumer. Then in our third year, we launched on Amazon. And then this month, we just launched into Walmart, Kroger, Target, Albertsons, and then Sprouts as well. So we've gone from being entirely an online business a few months ago to now being in around 7,000 stores across the country. Why so big so fast? It's a great question. There are a couple of reasons. One, we built our business to pretty meaningful scale online over the past three years. And so for us, going down the standard path of perhaps opening up one geographic region of a smaller natural retailer just wouldn't move the needle for us as a business. And so the typical path is you do that. You start with a region of a small natural retailer, and then maybe you prove to them you can go into a couple of hundred stores, and then maybe you do a smaller test with a big box retailer, like a Walmart or a Target. And eventually over the course of two to four years, you can eventually go nationwide and Target, Walmart, Albertsons, whatever it might be. We had the luxury of being able to skip that intermediate period because we built a sizable business online. And so we already have millions of customers, hundreds of thousands of social followers. And so we were able to go to retailers and say, we don't necessarily need to prove out that there's product market fit here like your average brand might need to. We don't need to point to a small region of a natural store. Instead, you can look at our online business, you can look at our Amazon business, you can see that we're already at scale, we already have awareness, and we're going to drive people into your stores from day one. We don't need to be incubated in a sort of small region of the country. So it was a combination of being able to do it and having that luxury when most brands don't have that luxury. And then also the fact that we had to do something that would really move the needle for our business as this next inflection point and going into a couple of hundred stores simply wouldn't. But you could have done one of those retailers rather than all three of those retailers at a given time and go hard after one of those retailers. I know we've actually interviewed some folks on the podcast that have a strategy of, I want to dominate and own that one retailer, then quickly expand. Is the idea of going through 7,500 stores just where the inflection point required for you to move the needle or... Was it just a, this is the culture of our company, we take big bets, and this is the swing that we need to make right now? It was a combination. So we actually did launch Target first. So Target launched a few months ago. And so that was like the main retailer we would launch with as our launch partner, go very deep with, prove that we could dominate on shelf with that one mainstream retailer. And that was initially 1,300 doors. When we proved to ourselves internally that we could make that happen, Making that happen means everything from the operational and logistical execution to being able to effectively translate our online marketing levers to an offline shelf, to having the internal systems for forecasting retail. There's a lot that goes into launching a retail business. So we started with Target. We made sure we could get it right and that it worked. And we quickly did get it right and learned that it was working. And so then we wanted to quickly go from there and so then we looked outward, who comes next? And in most categories in the grocery store, large retailers will reset the aisle once or twice a year. And it just so happened that many of the retailers we were looking to go to next all reset their shelves in January. So in an ideal world, would we have done perhaps Walmart January, Albertsons March, Kroger May, maybe would have given us a little bit more of a learning curve. But the reality was all those stores set their shelves in January. And so it was either do it now or wait a year. And we didn't feel as a business, we had the luxury of waiting, given the amount of competition, given our ambitions and what we're trying to grow to in the time frame we have. So very opportunistic, given the window of opportunity that you had. You know, scaling on e-commerce is obviously very different than scaling in store. You mentioned that you were confident in the operational and proof of concept muscle that you had in Target, but 7Xing your store count 
is very different than increasing your performance media budget by 7x. There's a lot more that goes with that. How are you confident in your operational capabilities to scale in that manner? Yeah, I mean, you're probably half right. So it's not as simple as just dialing up the spend on a Facebook ad, but we're not in thousands of different retailers. So we've gone from 1,000 to 7,000 stores. But we've only added on three retail partners. And so we're, we're probably 3Xing, not 7Xing the complexity. So it's a little bit less intense than you're describing, but they're all somewhat similar. They, of course, all have their nuances and their quirks and they all order with different lead times and they all forecast slightly differently. And some of them reliably under forecast, some reliably over forecast, and you have to know how to adjust. So there's definitely nuances, but we've quickly built a very strong retail team, both retail team on the sales side, but also the retail operations and retail logistics side. They quickly proved themselves with their target launch. And so we're excited to do more quickly. How do you measure success with all of these? As you started this year, it's nice, it's clean. It starts on an annual basis. If you look back at the end of this year and it's like very successful, moderately successful, this was a huge mistake. What are we doing? What are the various factors at play with this massive retail expansion? Yeah. So it's not dollars, which is probably what most people would think it would be. It's more than anything else, velocity on shelf. We want to prove that we can be one of, if not the best selling cereal everywhere that we put Magic Spoon. And that's partly by dollars, sometimes by units as well. And so that was our mindset when we launched on Amazon. We launched on Amazon and we quickly became top two, top three selling cereals by dollars and by units actually top three, not just within the healthy cereals, but the unhealthy broader category of cereal. And that's the mindset we have for retail here. And our definition of success will be a little bit different for a Sprouts, for example, than a Walmart, obviously to very different consumers. But we want to be the very top of the category by a unit sold per store, per week, per flavor, essentially. That means we're very careful not to, in any given retailer's case, not to say yes to every single store they're willing to give us. So for example, Walmart, some founders have wanted to enter into 5,000 Walmarts, but we're only doing about 1,800. The reason is we want to only be in the best stores within any given retailer to make sure that we perform very well anywhere that we're going to go. And we have a similar philosophy around flavors, hues. So even though some of these retailers were open to taking six or seven flavors, we want to make sure that anything we're putting into these stores is flying off the shelves. So we're being very disciplined with our flavors, with the number of stores. Ultimately, that means sacrificing revenue from a short-term perspective, but it's important to us as a business to make sure we win anywhere that we go. I have never personally been a part of this process, this buying process with retailers. So you're saying we were able to handpick the best 1800 Walmart stores. How are you actually able to do that? And what does the best actually mean? So it's a conversation and every retailer is a little bit different. It's a bit more nuanced than that. But in general, it's always a conversation and it depends a little bit where the leverage is, right? Sometimes a retailer will say to a brand, Hey, we're not so sure about you, even though we have 2000 stores, let's call it, we're going to start you off in 200, see how you perform. If you perform well, we'll give you another 200 and eventually you can grow. Sometimes if they're very bullish in a brand, and this happened in our case, they'll say, what do you want? Like how many stores do you want? How many SKUs do you want? And maybe they say no to the ask, but in our case, we found that they were very willing to work with us with it, whatever we wanted. What we said is we want a partnership and we want to put our products only where we know it's going to succeed. And then maybe if it knocks it out the park in this smaller group of stores, then next year we'll talk about adding on another 500, another thousand stores. And so we'll share with some information about our customers, demographics, geographies, all that kind of stuff. And then depending on the retailer, they'll either recommend or we'll work with a broker that's the kind of intermediary between a brand and a retailer to figure out roughly what grouping of stores makes sense, given our product and price point and demographics and all that kind of stuff. Is location usually the biggest factor there, like where the stores are placed in terms of state, or is it demographics of a given store that's the biggest factor in determining proper store allocation? It's both, but it's also what the aisle looks like in a given store. So for example, in the case of Target, you might think that being in the New York Targets or the LA Targets is the best place for us to be, but actually people don't buy cereal as often in those stores, and so they've got a very small cereal aisle 
that's not walked very often. And so even though if you're purely looking at geography, you'd say those should be the top of where we want to be. In this particular case, they're actually not because not that much cereal is bought in those specific stores for that specific retailer. So geography is definitely a large part of it, but it's not the only factor and it's a bit more nuanced. I would be very curious to know what stores are the best cereal stores in America. That's a fun thing to wonder. What's best for us is not necessarily best for cereal as well. And that's true for stores. That's also true for placement in the aisle. And so that's another level at which you're having this conversation is where in the cereal aisle do we want to be? And that may or may not be the same place that the retailer wants to place us. And what they consider prime placement for your average cereal brand might not actually be where we think we're going to perform well. Gabby, you seem to have an incredible degree of conviction and understanding of retail distribution. Despite being an e-commerce first brand for so long, you're the first to admit that you just started getting into this retail journey. How did you have such conviction on what's good and what's bad and knowing the way in which you want your brand placed now that you're so new to this part of the Magic Soon journey? Well, I'm flattered it comes across as conviction. I don't know I have complete conviction. We have hypotheses uh, and we're testing them. So there's lots of big, messy questions. And we've, because we were only online for the past three years, but we didn't start the business with the intention of only being online. We've been thinking about this for a long time. And so there's all these messy questions that we've had to answer. Even do we want to be in the cereal aisle? Initially, we thought our customers today are our first 100,000 customers. When we survey them, they do not walk the cereal aisle. And so there's an argument to make that we should actually be where people are walking who are going to want to buy our product, which is probably the protein bar aisle, the supplement aisle, maybe even beside eggs and like other fresh, healthy breakfast items. So there was even the conversation around like, where do we want to be? Is it the cereal aisle? And eventually we through triangulating lots of opinions and thinking through not only short-term revenue capture and where the customer is going to be, but also like long-term strategic outcomes for the business. For a number of reasons, we decided like we are a cereal company, we need to be in the cereal aisle, but it took us a while to get that conviction. And it's the same thing with all these other things. And even now we're testing and we're learning. So even down to the flavors we're taking to retail, we talk like we have a high degree of conviction in the flavors we're taking to retail. I believe we have a much higher degree of conviction than most brands that enter retail because you get three years of D2C data, Amazon data, not only what flavors perform well, but what flavors get the highest clicks on the ads or when we have our build your own box page in our website that sort of displays a virtual shelf of all of our flavors. What does the heat map look like? So we have pretty high degree of conviction that what we're doing from a flavor perspective makes sense, but we're also open to the idea that it just doesn't translate in every case. Aside from these main retailers I mentioned, we have a couple of smaller ones on the side that we're running tests with quietly to try and figure out, try and validate online learnings in an offline world, for example. So we're constantly testing too. What would be some of those tests and those other retailers? The biggest one is flavor distribution. We believe that we can look at various online metrics and from them conclude what's going to work offline. There's a chance some of that doesn't totally translate. And so we have a couple of areas where we're putting more flavors into a small number of retailers in a very controlled testing environment to see how people interact with them on a shelf, see how people interact with a different variety of flavors. So it could be, for example, that honey nut is a fantastic flavor for us, but if you put it beside a peanut butter, they just cannibalize each other too much. And so it's true that honey nut's great, but only if we don't have peanut butter on shelf. So all those kinds of things are things that we're experimenting with, both with additional online tests, but then also in some cases, some offline tests. I want to change gears a little bit here and many of the instances in which I've purchased Magic Spoon on your DTC site, the boxes have been paired with other flavors. I'm never purchasing single flavor Magic Spoon. Obviously that's intentional in that you increase your average order value per order and you have a high demand product. How do you think about flavor combinations as a means of bringing in new customers and hooking existing customers. It seems like you're using flavor as a really impactful lever within your retail strategy. If you go back to yesteryear on many of your successes on e how did you think about flavor packaging in general and finding like the right price point for given flavors for someone to buy? Yeah, maybe I'll take some of those questions in reverse order. Price point's a tricky one, and it's always a bit of a give and a take. We price our product as low as we can, 
our ingredients are so much more expensive than normal cereal ingredients, right? We're using whey protein isolate, natural sweeteners, natural flavors, which costs just many, many, many multiples, the price per pound of corn or wheat or cane sugar. And so often people will comment on our Facebook ads, like, how can you possibly charge $10 for a box of cereal? And someone will say, oh, they must be making huge margins. Like we're making normal margins for this kind of product. And that was the goal. So the price was a combination of what price do we just need to charge given the cost of our ingredients in order to have an industry standard margin. And then thinking through what absolute price point online do we need this to be at for the acquisition economics to make sense, basically. And so we had a bit of a hypothesis and tested around it, but we realized we need our average order value, or at least we need our sort of like first purchase basic product before we're doing upsells and everything else it needs to be a minimum like $40 or so. And so that was why we started selling a four pack for $39. It also worked out quite nicely because it was a month's worth of cereal if you're having one serving a day. And so we could position it as like $39 for a month of cereal for breakfast, as opposed to $39 for four boxes of cereal. So the positioning was helpful as well. In terms of driving repeat purchase, new flavors was most of our strategy. We have an incredible best in class retention team doing everything that a brand could possibly do on email and SMS and loyalty and everything else. But probably like just as important as that is having firstly an amazing product that people want to come back to in general, but then giving them a reason to come back and like try different versions of it. So alongside the sort of classic retention playbook, we've put a huge amount of emphasis on making sure we're always releasing new flavors. So every four to six weeks, we'll release two new flavors and we decide on them through a combination of looking at the landscape and other categories, but also serving our customers. And we have some sort of early taste testers and things like that as well. Unlike most brands of your size and stage, you've raised a significant amount of capital. I'd love to learn what your strategy was in terms of finding out the amount of capital required to scale the business that you hoped, why you raised as much as you did, and general thoughts on raising venture capital for an emerging brand like yourself. I'm sorry I'm throwing so many questions at you at once, no, no, but you're doing a very good, good job of unpacking them. <laughs> Appreciate it. So I'll start from the beginning. So we raised a million dollars before we launched, basically on the idea. And my co-founder and I had another business that we spent five years building, and it was a slog. And so this was a personal choice for us that we would happily own a little bit less if we could increase the odds of success and also just give ourselves a bit more breathing room. And so we raised a million dollars with the idea, basically from investors who we'd worked with before and from investors who trusted us and we trusted them. And so that's like a huge caveat. I think everything we've done, there's no world I would do it with investors that I didn't know and that there wasn't mutual trust and that there wasn't breathing room. To fast forward, we've raised about $100 million total, but it's almost always from investors that I've known from a long time. And it's always being with very clear alignment on expectations. I think some people might see a headline and think, oh, it's a food company pretending they're a tech company raising our unrealistic valuations and it's all gonna come crashing. Like we've been very deliberate not to do that. So from a valuation perspective, we've always comped to sort of market multiples of what a brand like ours will justify at exit or at IPO, for example, as opposed to taking like the highest possible valuation we could get in the given moment. That's not the goal. That always ends up hurting the founder, I believe. And then back to the initial philosophy for my co-founder and I, we want to build a very large successful business. Ultimately, whether we own 20 or 40 or 60 or 80% of it, if we accomplish what we're trying to accomplish at the scale that we hope to, it's not going to matter ultimately. And so what we want to do is maximize the odds that we succeed and we dominate next generation cereal, basically. And we've known from the beginning that we're going up against three huge companies, basically, not to mention smaller startup competitors. And we knew from the beginning they were going to come out with copycat products. And they did sooner than we thought. So now we have a Kellogg's competitor, a Post competitor, two General Mills competitors, and some startups as well. And so being well capitalized, if our goal is to win and dominate this whole new category of next generation cereal, it's very helpful to have deep pockets, less deep than the Kellogg's and the Mills of the world, but more deep than a startup that's been around for three years on average. So it's been part of the strategy, but it's not something we took lightly. 
And it's not something we did just because we could. It was very measured with people we trust around the table and aligning on expectations and doing it with a very clear goal in mind and clear way that we're going to deploy the capital as well. I understand being well capitalized, a emerging brand like yourself could theoretically be well capitalized with $20 million as an example. Why a hundred million? It seems a very significant number that in this world that we just came from in which capital was very cheap. I think that a lot of companies, and I'm not saying that Magic Spoon has this, but I'm coming from the tech world and I've seen this, that a lot of technology companies were not judicious with the capital that they deployed after raising capital. And there was a significant amount of bloat and constraints sometimes are the best things for growing a business and building the muscles required to build that business. I'm curious to know to what extent you are concerned about raising too much and how you came up with the number that you thought was ultimately the amount required for you to hit the next milestones for your business. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a few things. There's a few ways that raising money can go wrong. One is what you said, you get too loose with spending, it's there, so you spend it and then you make bad decisions. But that's not an inevitable result of raising too much money, right? You can put up guardrails and constraints, even though you've got the money in the bank. So for us on the D2C side, we've got very strict guardrails on spend and CAC and everything is very closely monitored and measured. We didn't suddenly say, hey, we've got more money. Now we can double our CAC target. We're still running the business like we ran the business. We can just put more money to work if and when it makes sense. So I guess that's the first point. So we're not, I'm not too worried about us getting loose with the spending and overspending because in every department, we have systems in place to prevent that happening. And everybody's very disciplined and that's like a core part of the culture. The other way over raising goes wrong is if you've set up the right expectations with your investors or set unrealistic goals. And again, that's not something that we've done and we've been very careful not to do it. We didn't say to our investors, we want to raise this enormous amount of money to be bigger than Kellogg's in three years. And then if that doesn't happen, they're disappointed and they stop backing us and we run out of money. That's not happening. Everybody's very aware of what the yearly goals are. They're all realistic. And we didn't tie the raise to an unrealistic valuation either. So the valuation has always made sense in the context of our revenue and other metrics that valuations are typically based on in this industry. So there's no misalignment of valuation or expectations or what's going to happen down the road. And when there's not, then things shouldn't break. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah it does. It does. Uh, we've spoken a lot about the significant growth that you've had on e-commerce and chatting with you, you cite a number of things that have been really helpful within that growth, but specifically influencer marketing and working with creators as being a formative piece within that. Can you speak a little bit to the influencer marketing strategy that you've employed over the past few years? Yeah, of course. So our influencer marketing strategies, it's evolved over time. In the early days, it involved getting influencers on board as investors in the business. So the first million dollars we raised, about 500,000 of that was actually from small health and wellness influencers that wrote us five, 10, 15 grand checks, but were then very incentivized to get behind the business in the first month. And so that enabled us to have a very good first couple of months of sales online and ultimately raise the next round of funding that we did shortly after we launched. And that was influencers as investors, usually under 500,000 followers, health and wellness focused. And we also paid them an affiliate commission. So they were both incentivized through their equity, but also through a percentage of sales. And then we also carved out an additional equity pool in the business for the top performing influencer investors who continued to perform and drive real revenue. So there was like three incentives. And what that meant was there were like some influencers with, you know, 200,000 followers maybe that were driving six figures in sales for us in the first few months. And they got to own a meaningful piece of the company because of that that enabled us to go and raise more money at the right valuations. It was great for us, but they now also own like a pretty meaningful part of the company from driving those early sales. And so just a win-win for everyone would highly recommend a similar structure to early stage founders. It then evolved. And I actually think it took too long to evolve. And one of the things I got wrong in the early days was I said, we will never pay an influencer upfront. I was very against doing that. I used to always just say to the team, no, if an influencer thinks they can actually deliver sales, they should take a percentage of the sales they generate. Why would we commit to paying 20, 30 grand to an influencer before they've proven themselves? And I was like a little bit arrogant and like dogmatic about that. 
And what we realized was that the best influencers, they didn't need to offer that to us because they already had so many brands going to them. And so we were losing out on solid influencers that actually do perform. They just like didn't care about us and they had no reason to because, you know, we were being too demanding of the structure. And when we opened that up and we started offering to pay influencers up front, not doing it blindly, but talking to other brands that had worked with them and getting data from the other brands or figuring out an agency that sometimes helped out on the brand side with them and figuring out from that agency, how do they perform on average? When we opened up that, paying mid-tier influencers upfront cash, that was the next unlock for us. And we were able to spend quite meaningfully, maybe a third to half of our like paid social spend on influencers, that sort of structure is paying upfront. Sometimes we do a combination of upfront cash and affiliate commission. And then the next iteration of our sort of influencer journey was product collaborations with larger influencers. So we've worked with huge TikTokers, for example, maybe a box behind me here. We like created these characters from these TikTokers. So these are members of TikTok house and we worked with them to create these characters, made this jelly donut flavor with them. They taste tested and everything. And then part of the deal was they promote across their various social channels over a period of time. We made probably a hundred thousand boxes, did a revenue share with them, sold out in a couple of weeks. And so that's the sort of most recent iteration of how we're structuring the larger scale influencer partnerships. That's very interesting. And I guess one of the things that the savvy influencers must know is that most people don't click the affiliate link. Only a small percentage of the people that they actually influence are clicking this link. So why should they only be compensated for a small portion of the revenue that they're driving to you? Is that a bit of it as well? Some of them will say that. I don't know if they actually believe that. I mean, Do you I believe that? Not really. It's true that a very small portion click the affiliate link, but I would argue yeah. that if they're not clicking it, then they're not really being influenced in an immediate way. And it depends on the product. If it's like a high consideration product, like a thousand dollar mattress, sure, not everybody's going to click the affiliate link right there and then and buy it that day. And so there's a longer window of attribution. Our product is not very high consideration. It's a box of cereal. So I would argue if an influencer is posting about us and they have a link right there and it's $5 off, get a free box, $30 purchase. If someone wants it, they're probably going to click it and buy it right then and there. They're not going to sleep on it for the next week. But I think what's happening more so, especially in this post iOS world, there's so many brands that have pulled back spend from paid social. They're trying to dump it into influencer and podcast and all these new channels and they're driving up influencer costs, demand for influencers. And so these large influencers, they have so many brands coming to them that haven't done much influencer marketing before, and they're just saying yes to the price. And so the influencers can command that price. And so there's no reason for them to take on the risk of being paid purely on performance if they can command the full price without that. That's also very reasonable. You mentioned podcasts being a channel that brands are using these days. You've used podcasts as well. Can you speak to how you thought of podcasts as a distribution strategy and where sequentially that was strategic for Magic Spoon on its journey? Yeah, that was probably the third main channel we unlocked. So after paid social and influencer, we then went to podcast. And we view podcasts kind of the same as we view influencer. Internally, our team is structured that we have someone managing endorsement, which is anywhere that somebody is talking about Magic Spoon endorsing it. And so that's mostly podcast and influencer across YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. And we take a similar approach again to influencer marketing. There's not really much of an affiliate space in podcasts. So there's not a lot of shows that we pay on performance, but we'll measure them in a similar way to how we'd measure a long tail influencer channel, like YouTube influencer, for example, we find that the curves look similar, the pricing's kind of similar and learnings that we have in terms of the genre of a YouTube influencer versus a podcast host, those learnings are pretty translatable. We just view it as another endorsement channel. And we do everything from large podcasts like Pod Save America, we sponsor frequently, down to smaller ones that are more niche. And you know, you need the scale from the big ones, you need the performance from the small ones, that all kind of blends out. I'd say the biggest unlock and learning for us was probably that genre actually doesn't matter. So whether it's YouTube or podcast, we used to think that we should go after fitness, foods, health and wellness, whatever kind of makes intuitive sense. What we realized, especially for podcasts, is that it's actually about having a host that influences people and a host that people look to more than they look to the show. 
So a podcast like New York Times Daily, for example, people don't listen to that mostly, don't listen to that because they love the host. They listen to that because they want the content. Whereas something like the Tim Ferriss podcast, people don't really care what he's talking about. They dial in because it's Tim Ferriss and they want to hear him talk. And so that distinction was probably the biggest learning in terms of what podcasts will deliver sales. And some of those, pod, like a Tim Ferriss podcast sponsorship is very significant. You mentioned that you went after, I would say, mid-tier influencers that cost in the tens and thousands of dollar range, not the hundreds of thousands of dollar range. Did you go after the mid-market podcasters as well? Or did you go big with Tim Ferriss? Or was it a sequence for both of those? It was a combination. For all these channels, when we we're first testing them, we're not going to test into podcasts as a channel and test a, a broad range of genres over a reasonable time frame. You're probably talking about that being a fifty or seventy-five thousand dollar test, and so to use a large portion of that test budget on one large podcaster w- wouldn't make sense. So we didn't test large podcasts at the beginning, but once we had proved out the channel over the course of a few months, then we started looking at the larger ones and yeah, dipped our toe in there and discovered some that worked really well. Tim Ferriss was a unique case because he was an investor in our last business. We'd got to know him. And so we're able to test into that one without a large commitment. But for those other larger ones, like the Pod Save America, they definitely came a little bit later. Getting back to my similar question around influencers, did you measure the success of podcasting with a coupon code that you can then attribute back to that individual podcast? Or was it a halo when you knew that show was running? It was closer to the former of those. We did vanity URLs. So magicspin.com slash pod save america of yep. course not everybody remembers that they just google yep. it we look at post-purchase surveys and we ask not only like where did you hear about us but then we follow up if they say podcast with asking for specific answers and then we also do a discount code so through the combination of vanity url post-purchase survey discount code and then through some other testing means we figured out what multiplier to apply onto those three things we can triangulate around a pretty good view of what the show is doing in terms of online. That's interesting. We've spoken a lot about the measurement and these are very clear performative metrics and a very methodical approach. And you're quite proud of the fact that you've never run traditional brand marketing, but you've invested a lot in brand. Can you speak to why you've made conscious decisions? And now, presumably, you're at this inflection point of the business. Maybe brand marketing or traditional brand marketing, so to speak, is a great opportunity for you. Why have you not made any of those brand marketing decisions in the past? Might it be an appropriate time now? And why is it that people think about you as this significant top of funnel company when you're actually not investing in that much at the top of the funnel in a traditional sense? Yeah. So we invested a lot up front in design and brand means something very different to different people, depending on who you ask. I think lots of people who are familiar with our company would say Magic Spoon has an amazing brand, but what they actually mean is Magic Spoon has really great design. So our Mm -hmm. packaging, our characters, our website, up front, we invested a lot and we continue to do so. We've got an amazing in-house creative team on making sure that we look and feel amazing and create the sense of nostalgia that we want people to feel when they come near our brand and consume our products. But you're right. Historically, we've essentially never put money into any marketing channels that are not direct response. We do do channels, though, that another brand might consider brand marketing. So... We spend on podcasts, we spend on influencers, we run TV ads right now, but we're not doing them as a brand play. We're not measuring them in terms of impressions or brand recall or anything like that. Any channel we spend on right now, we're measuring from a direct response perspective. We're only spending in it if we can actually track a return. And currently that's about a return from online sales. I think you're right. This is a new moment where There are other ways to get returns from marketing that aren't as easy to measure. And so you could argue that maybe we run a TV ad next month, doesn't quite deliver the return on ad spend we wanted to our online business, but you might say, well, it's probably increasing your sales on shelves at Walmart and Target. We're working on ways to measure that. It's much harder, but there are ways to measure it. You can run the ad only in certain geographies, 
Walmart and Target both give pretty great data in terms of like daily velocities. So there are some ways to measure that. And we plan for the foreseeable future to really just be spending in areas where we can measure the return rather than running a huge ad for awareness or a influencer campaign for impressions. How are you activating TV ads out of curiosity? What's the channel there? We do linear TV. So it's old school, Interesting. classic TV. We're yeah. basically not doing connected TV. Why? We, yeah, we found that, so connected TV, obviously you can target people more closely in terms of geographies, demographics, interests, whatever, but you pay for that targeting. And for a product like ours, which is quite mainstream, it simply doesn't make sense to pay more for a view of our TV ad in order to target more because we actually want to go after a pretty broad audience. So we found that old school linear TV paying the lowest amount we can on a pretty broad range of networks, it could be Animal Planet, could be CNN, whatever. We're just, we're trying to maximize cost per view. And then we have a few different ways of measuring the actual visits to our site and conversions on our site as well. If we get back to the questions that we were just talking about, don't you lose attribution from linear to connected? Like, isn't the attribution there, there worse? There are some ways... The attribution is harder, but there are some ways to get at it. Do you want to share secrets or is the, the magic of magic spoon is not for this podcast? <laughs> well, it's, it's honestly, it's less that I don't want to share the secrets and more that's something I'm not as close to. And okay, so right. I see, I see the, I see the analysis, but I couldn't talk you through the methodology, but we can pretend it's a secret and magic. How did you think about setting an initial budget for your first TV campaigns? We just mentioned you started small and then went bigger. TV is something naturally that you can't start small. How did you think about initial budget there? Honestly, we could start a similar size to we started on podcast, for example, or even YouTube influencer. I mean, those other channels, technically you can start small, right? So you could tell yourself you can test influencer marketing with five grand, but you can't really like with five grand, you're testing an influencer or three influencers. You're not testing influencer marketing as a channel. If you want to test the channel, you need 20 or 30 influencers, some big, some small, some food, some politics, some true crime, and three months to measure it over. And then maybe you need another test because maybe it's not definitive. So for any of these channels to really test them, if you're like testing whether they can really scale, you're still looking at probably high five, if not low six figures. And so TV was not dissimilar. There are agencies where you can test TV as a channel for 50, 75 grand, depending on whether you want to test just connected, just linear or both. And so it wasn't totally different scale from some of these other channels. The caveat is that the creative for TV can be expensive. So if you want to not even high budget, if you want to just do any kind of nice looking TV ad and have a 15 second version, a 30 second version, you probably want a couple of different concepts to test that can be costly. And if you're not deliberately trying to do it really cheap, that could cost as much as the actual ad spend itself. And so that was an area that we deliberately didn't spend much on initially. And then actually when we did spend more on it later after we proved out the channel, the higher budget ads we shot didn't perform as well. And you'll probably hear that from most DTC brands. I guess similar philosophy as to why UGC works well in paid social, having something that's a little bit different to what the consumers used to seeing on the TV, a bit more casual, a bit more realistic, a bit more believable. So me or my co-founder are talking to the camera, shot on an iPhone even, in some cases outperforming, like things that we actually had a director for and a crew and actors and makeup and everything. Yeah, I hear that all the time for social content, but I don't hear that as much for TV. It's actually the inverse most of the time. And people say, your social content won't work, that UGC quick and dirty stuff that you're using for social isn't going to work on TV. And I guess that's not the case for you all. It depends. Not everything that works on social is going to work on TV. We've tried influencer testimonials on TV. That doesn't, for us, that didn't really pour it over. But the sort of founder story, casual, quick and dirty, talking to camera ad, that worked well. That being said, we haven't tested like the big, big budget version of TV. So we've never had a celebrity in a TV ad, anything like that. So I couldn't speak to whether that will out or underperform what we've done. And we've spoken a lot about your growth on e-commerce and somewhere along that journey, Amazon was a big piece of that growth. You've been wildly successful on Amazon. You've alluded to that earlier during our discussion. When was the right time for you to get on Amazon? 
and what were some of the pillars of the success of your Amazon launch in your view? So we probably waited too late to get on Amazon. I was nervous to go on Amazon because I didn't think that people would buy four boxes on Amazon. And I didn't want to list one or two boxes on Amazon because it would undercut our DTC business and cannibalize it. And the context there is that no cereal brand is really selling multiple boxes on Amazon. They all sell single boxes. So for two years, I just said, oh, we can't do Amazon because if we do Amazon, we could have listed a single box. If we have a single box on Amazon for $9, why would anybody come to our website and spend 40? And then one day, I think our head of growth, Yunji, was just like, why don't we just test if we can sell four boxes on Amazon? Like, maybe you're just wrong. And so we did. And I was totally wrong. We didn't go to Amazon at the right time. We went too late because I just had this assumption that seemed reasonable to me, but it was totally mistaken. And I think other brands wait too long for other wrong reasons. I hear all the time from high priced products that they think Amazon's going to undermine their brand. We're not talking about like a luxury watch brand or fashion brand. We're talking about high end CPG or food products. I don't think that's a very good argument. And so I think for us and most brands in general, going to Amazon sooner rather than later probably makes sense. And we also just saw the number of branded and non-branded searches we were getting that our competitors were sweeping up. We had agencies literally emailing us saying, do you know this random Amazon brand you've never heard of made $200,000 last month purely from bidding on Magic Spoon cereal search words? And so at a certain point, we were just like, damn, that, like, that should be ours. And that the numbers kept on getting higher and higher. And so that combined with UG saying, let's just sell four boxes, eventually we went for it. And we kept it very simple. We launched a limited SKU selection. We didn't want to cannibalize our D2C site too much by having every SKU available on Amazon. And beyond that, we worked with Cartograph for a long time. They were a fantastic launch partner for us to get on Amazon. And I'm not sure we really have any secrets. We look at Amazon and retail as somewhere to send customers who are not going to buy D2C. For both of those additional channels, once people have gone through a certain journey on our website, if either they've churned, maybe bought once three months ago, but they haven't bought again, or if they've been through our warm up sequence and they're still not buying online, we have these multiple groups of customers, multiple cohorts that we will send to Amazon now to retail and stuff like that. So that's probably one unfair advantage we have with these like large groups of D2C customers that for whatever reason we've decided are not primed to buy D2C again, we can now send them over to these other channels. Interesting. And it's very likely as you expand to many retail locations and you go to Amazon that just by way of effort alone and the purchasing of products, the percentage distribution of your total sales is going to dramatically alter from D to C first to likely retail first by the end of this year. I guess the thing that I'm wondering is as we've spoken a lot about the levers and channels that you have to pull to grow your brand. And it's clear that a lot of the levers that you've initially pulled over the last three years have been e-commerce focused levers. How do you think as you go into this next inflection point of the magic spoon journey, the levers will change? And how do you think about what's important and how you allocate your marketing and advertising dollars to optimize for your new customer segment in the way in which they buy? Yeah, that's the multiple million dollar question it is how we evolve our marketing mix and think through attribution in a omni-channel world. But on some level, we need to add in new channels, right? There are marketing channels that we haven't done yet that we're learning. And some of that's simple stuff. Like our creative team this week was working on floor talkers, which is literally like you walk into a Kroger and we're designing something to go on the floor of the protein powder aisle that says, when you get your protein from cereal instead, go over to aisle 12. So there's, there are channels that just like, we've never even thought about for a second that we're now getting into that are more retail focused. And then there's repurposing some of our channels for new goals. And that's something that's quite easy for us to do. And for example, we wanted to make sure that our Walmart launch was paired with a lot of influencer activity. And so we've looked at our top performing influencers historically. We've taken the group of them that we believe through looking at various sources that their audience is aligned with the sort of Walmart consumer. And we're having them create a new type of influencer content for us 
where they do like a shop along in a Walmart store and they say, hey, come find my favorite cereal in my local Walmart. Like, here it is. Go buy it. And so it's just repurposing something we've already become pretty good at for a different goal. And then we take that influencer content and just like we would with D2C, we whitelist on Facebook, we spark ads on TikTok, which is where you're running an ad from the influencer's account, basically. So it looks like an influencer post. And so that has measurably driven sales in the retailers we've done this in. And it's not that different from what we've done previously in influencer marketing. It's just a different version of the same tactic. And these are things that most brands in these stores are not doing. And so there's a comparable thing we could do for many of these other channels, whether it's Facebook ads or podcasts or whatever it might be. And so we're thinking through the new channels that we need to learn and get good at, become proficient at. But then also, how do we repurpose what we're already experts at to drive offline sales using these online levers? And now that you're in retail, traditional retail media outside of Amazon is obviously going to become a pretty significant pillar of your advertising mix. Getting back to this, where we started and the growth of retail channels, to what extent in your conversations with a Walmart, Albertsons, and Kroger was the notion of commitments to spend on retail media in addition to traditional shopper marketing budgets as part of this in-store expansion? It comes off a little bit. I think we've got the luxury of having built this online brand and so having some leverage of these retailers that we haven't had to spend on things like slotting or free fill. Often a new brand will have to pay for their space on the shelf in various ways. And so we've been really grateful to have like good partnerships where we don't have to spend money for the sake of spending money with these retailers. But at the same time, you're right, they, in many cases, do have expectations for how we're going to support them. And sometimes those expectations are to spend in areas that actually drive results. Other ways, less so results, it's just part of the game. And so we've had those conversations, but I think at the end of the day, it all depends on how a brand performs. If we perform as we believe we're going to perform in retail and our velocities are let's call it top 10%, top 5% of all the cereals that X retailer has on shelf, they're going to be very happy. If we don't, if somehow we're at the bottom half of cereals, they're going to be very unhappy. And if they're very unhappy, they're going to ask us to spend more with them to make up for the velocity. And if we're performing very well, they're going to be happy enough and not necessarily push for us to spend in unnecessary ways. So it's all a conversation. And I think the extent to which these sort of things are enforced is really about how well you're performing or not. Lovely. Gabby, this was an awesome conversation. I actually learned a ton. I'm also getting very hungry. I have some Magic Spoon cereal bars that we haven't even spoken about that I'm a huge fan of as well. Would love to finalize the discussion with one question and everyone loves predictions. What would you say your prediction is for e-commerce and retail media in 2023? Oh. Try and think of something controversial to say, but I think you're going to see more brands doing what we're doing sooner. And so we waited a long time to become Omnichannel, waited a long time to launch Amazon. And in the past couple of years, I hear a lot from brands or founders that reach out and say, hey, we're launching a D2C brand. I think you're going to hear less and less of that and much more about just launching a brand. I think we're past the time where D2C can actually be a business model. You can't make something cheaply overseas and cut out the store and just put it online and undercut the mainstream brands. You can't do that anymore with a razor or a mattress. The paid social economics don't make sense. The importing doesn't make sense. You just can't do that. I think we're beyond the moment of D2C as a business model, and we're going to see less and less brands describing themselves as such, though it can still be a main distribution tactic like it was for us. I love it. It'll be really interesting to see I think we've spoken a fair bit about this, the sequence of events, right? Like you've been able to be successful on Amazon because of all of these learnings that you've had on D2C and driving e-commerce growth through distinct marketing channels. You were then able to have significant amount of initial retail distribution from your success of both Amazon and DTC. So I'll be curious to know as people be, think omni-channel first, how they can create the optimal sequence for them and their growth. I'm not sure how that will play out, but it'll be very interesting. Gabby, this was an awesome conversation. Really, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. 
Thank you. This is Growth Sessions, a podcast to fuel your e-commerce growth. Listen and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Thank you.